What time it is right now? If I could have everybody's attention, we're supposed to start at 8, and that's what it is, and we got a longer than normal meeting today, which most of ours are pretty quick anyway. Uh, Robert, you want to tell the good Lord look after us ahead, today? Sir. Sir, first thing I want to tell y'all is uh, thank the committee very much for everything you did when Daddy died. Uh, y'all sent a great big old spray, and uh, I didn't ask them to, but they evidently realized that the funeral home high important. Y'all ordered me, and they had it sitting right out front next to where everybody walks in, and I appreciate everything, and, and uh, I know some of you contributed to uh, the Friends Helping Friends thing, and uh, that means a whole lot, and I appreciate it. Thank y'all very much. Y'all mean more than more than I can tell you personally to, uh, to my family and me, so uh, thank you. If you look on the agenda, the first thing on there is House Bill 341. We're going to hold that till next week. It was going to be a hearing only, and uh, Representative Pack and Marin are not quite ready. Uh, to talk. Um, it, it wasn't anything we had to vote on, so it's not anything pushing. Uh, we're going to try to do the two Senate bills, and then we have a couple of um, presentations that I think y'all will be real interested in. I have invited some other folks that may be interested in a couple of them to come. But whether they get here or not, I don't know. So without anything else, Senator again. You want to come up to the hot seat right there, please, sir? That'd be fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anybody got any questions? This is basically taking something out of the book, right? Yes, sir. You got an idea who's going to handle it over here? The, uh, uh, I'm going to ask the chairman the, uh, to handle it. To handle a point and somebody to handle it. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, your bill ain't out yet. <laughs> question. All right, Rob. You will buy a Sydney, y'all have anything? 
Any more questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, no. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. If any of us ever come to economic development on the wrong side of the Capitol over there, if we wind up there, just from remember how easy this was. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Wilkinson. What do you want to do 209 first? Oh, okay. How about doing 97 first then? All right. I, uh, first, before he gets started, everybody look in your folder. First thing all the beef cattle folks need to do is tell Terry England, thank you for line 40.1.2 in the budget. That's your bull test guy in Calhoun. And talk to Jack Hill and tell him not to mess with that particular line in the budget. Uh, to all the folks on the committee, there's some cattle facts in your, in your folders talking about beef cattle. Farm Bureau's got a handout in your folder. And also, if any of you might be interested in where your ribeyes and your New York strips and your hamburger come from, that's what this beef cut thing is. And anybody in the audience that may want to know where they come from, we got a stack of them up here. I'll be glad to let you look. I'll give you one. Uh, you eat beef, you all know where it comes from. So without me saying anything else, Chairman, go ahead, sir. Thank you for coming over here. Have any questions for the chairman? Huh? Executive Secretary of the Cattlemen Association, Josh White, is here. Did you want to? Okay. Sure. Uh, Jeffrey, 
has a lot of spiritual commodities as well. So it is administered by the uh, Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. All commodities commissions are. And uh, the commodities commission, once appointed, decides how to spend the money. It's a farmer uh, run. There are there will be five members of this specified in this bill. The three members will be cattle producers, one will be a livestock market operator, and one will be a dairy. So we're incorporating all the stakeholders that will pay into the checkoff, what we call the checkoff of the commodity uh, promotion. And um, ensure after the presentation. And they will decide how to spend the money. And they hold within the boundaries of they would be able to assist up to a dollar a head, not more than a dollar a head, and then if uh, an animal sells for this, then a hundred dollars a head if we're not specific to the assessment. If you look on the bottom of the front page of this hand and out, and the bottom of the back page of this hand and out, it kind of answers what you were asking. But I had to look myself Rick, to make sure it was in here for that. I don't know what it says, who will decide, and then uh, how do we know they'll be spent wisely. That, that kind of gets into who's handling it and who's looking after it. But thank you for asking that, because it's going to get asked on the floor, I'm sure. All right. Any other is, uh, is more questions? Same? Mr. Chairman, I just want to say thank you guys. The police producer and Bill Cabin and Tommy and everybody put this together. I think it's going to be great for the industry. I'm just going to put it to the next one. I'm going to make it to my third. 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 All in favor say aye. Aye. Pull no. Sam, you're going to handle this on this side. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I hate to do this to you, but there's been some questions pop up in the last 10 minutes, about 209, and I, I have been asked to wait till next week. Is that okay with you? Well, I don't think it's anything big, but there's a question or two. Okay, that's fine. Is that, is that all right? Okay. I'll, I'll just a little bit after he put me on after the front, but I'm going to send her again because I got a meeting at 9 o'clock. <laughs> 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 but everything worked out for the case. I was amazed that we ain't got to you yet with him in here. That's what. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, also, Loma. Beef cattle lines. <coughs> Cattlemen's doing their breakfast in the morning. Uh, everybody is invited, not just the ag committee, but the ag committee is especially invited. Is it uh, two thirty? Room two thirty in the morning starts at seven fifteen. And they steak biscuits and they eat cube steak. They real tenderloin steak biscuits. It'll be worth your time to try to eat one of them. Uh, also for the ag committee, while I'm on the eating part. Uh, tomorrow at lunch, what room is that in your pass? In 216, the uh, game file breeders are, are having a lunch for, for the ag committees. So uh, we get to eat beef in the morning and the, uh, the chickens at, at dinner time. Uh, we, uh, we have two presentations, and right before we get to that, we. According to the Equine Commodity Commission law, we have to appoint an ex officio member. The Senate does one and the House does one. One of them has to be from the South, one of them has to be from the North. And uh, it's delineated in the bill what North is. So basically it's making North. It's what we have to appoint one from. I'm going to assign a subcommittee to get together before next week, if you don't mind. Uh, Bubba Epps, would you mind, since you're on the exposition of thought, to be in the chairman of this subcommittee? And then I'm going to appoint Sam Watson, Margaret Kaiser, Patty Bentley, Regina Quick, and Dale Rutledge. I'll give the new folks on the committee uh, something to come back, if that's all right with everybody. 
we got to. Um, <laughs> 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 Can we make a recommendation? We, we got to uh, to pick the ex officio member for the equine commission. We have to do it every odd number year. And this happened to be an odd number year, so. Uh, Anyway, if y'all can come up with something by next week, if you've got any questions from me or any of the others, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you. Uh, all right, we got two presentations, and y'all will be real interested in them. Patty, you want to introduce the Fort Valley people? Good morning again. I'm very proud to have with us this morning from the Fort Valley State University, the other land-grant institution of the state, uh, Dr. Mark Lattimore, Jr., Assistant Vice President, um, ser also serving as Interim Assistant Vice President and um, Administrator for Extensions at Fort Valley State University. He's going to come and share with us now some of the good things that are going on at Fort Valley State. Dr. Lattimore, thank you for being here this morning. Fort Valley State, as we all know, is in beautiful Peach County that is represented by uh, Representative Robert Dickey and myself. So we'd love to invite all of you down to the Peach Festival in June. Get some of that homemade peach cobbler. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving us this opportunity. I don't know how many other states have it, but we have two land-grant colleges in the state of Georgia, and we're lucky to have them, uh, especially when it deals with agriculture. Yes, sir. And, uh, mm -hmm. One's in Athens, and one is in Fort Valley. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman and the members of the committee, uh, first I would like to thank uh, Representative Bentley uh, for the invitation and also Representative uh, Dickey uh, for, the, for, the, for, the for the opportunity to address you this morning. Uh, while the photos have been circulated, I just, I'd just like to give you just a little information about me. Uh, I grew up in southwest Georgia, a place called Western Georgia. Anybody heard of Western Georgia? Yeah, okay, it's about halfway between Columbus and, Amer and, uh, and Albany. And I always tell people that the people in Columbus get their mail from Weston, through Weston. Uh, growing up in southwest Georgia, I grew up on a farm. And we did, we raised primarily peanuts and corn during that time. I did my undergrad at Fort Valley State. I got my master's from University of Georgia uh, in soil, soil microbiology. Uh, Dr. Joel Gidden was my advisor. And I spent about 10 years in the Midwest. Uh, first at University of Missouri. And then the other five was Chevron as a research agronomist. So I had an opportunity in 84 to move back to Georgia, uh, back to Fort Valley State. Uh, for some reason, I couldn't shake that land grant, uh, uh, I would say, initiation that I received early. And as a result of that, I have enjoyed the opportunity of being at Fort Valley State as well as collaborating and working with my friends at the University of Georgia. Uh, many of you may not know, but Scott, the Dean of the College of Agriculture, Environmental Science in Georgia, and I shared the same advisor in, at, at Missouri uh, about the same, uh, during the same time. So we go, we go back away as well. Um, Fort Valley State University, as the chairman indicated, is a land-grant university. It's an 1890 land-grant university, and you, you are familiar with that. Uh, as an 1890 land-grant university, we offer degrees in agriculture. Uh, we have research as well as corporate extension. Uh, my responsibilities now focus primarily on with corporate extension. I taught soils for years, uh, and uh, as in recent years, I've, I've been extension administrator uh, in the area of corporate extension. Uh, in the, at Fort Valley State, in the College of Agriculture, we had the College of Agriculture, the College of Arts and Sciences, as well as the College of Education. Uh, but my love is the College of Agriculture, Founder Science, and Technology. Uh, presently, we have student enrollment somewhere around 475, 480 students. 
Our majors include agriculture, economics, ag education, environmental, soil science, horticulture, animal science, uh, veterinary technology, ag engineering technology, and in the area of family consumer sciences, well, before family consumer science, you can get degrees, a degree, a BS degree in agriculture in the areas in which I just named. Uh, we also have family consumer sciences with emphasis on nutrition, infant and child development, as well as education. Those are BS degree uh, programs and areas. We have two master degree programs, one in animal science and another one in biotechnology. In biotechnology, we have an animal emphasis as well as a plant emphasis as well. Uh, our students go on to graduate, go, go, go on to graduate schools at the master level as well as the terminal degree level if we can keep them from, from going to industry long enough to, uh, to pursue those degrees. And we definitely need individuals uh, at the graduate level in order to fill a lot of the slots that's, that's, that's vacant throughout, not only throughout Georgia, but also throughout the country. Uh, so that is a challenge as far as, uh, as, far as students in, in agriculture. Uh, that just not, we just not graduated enough students in agriculture. Uh, for facility perspective, I, I want to stop and just thank you for the Safe Center, which is a is this is a, this is a facility that was funded by the department by the by the, by the ag commission. Uh, we were able to complete the facility and move into the facility last fall. So we're very excited about that. What is the Safe Center? Uh, the Safe Center. Uh, is a facility, in the case of emergency where evacuation is uh, needed, uh, we can house somewhere between, uh, I think about 80 horses uh, in the facility, uh, 100 dogs, 100 cats. So it's a very nice facility. You probably, you, you will see it in, in, your, in your package, at least part of it anyway. Uh, we're in the process of completing a biotechnology addition to our Star Wars research facility. So that project is way on the way, and we're very excited about that one. Uh, we have a family development and a child development project that we are in the process of finalizing the budget this week so we can submit it to the board for approval. Uh, these projects are facility-funded projects through USDA, a facility grant that we receive through USDA. Uh, we also have a Head Start program that's, that serves several counties in the, in the state, primarily the central part of the state. Uh, the Head Start program is operated through the College of Agriculture. Are there any questions thus far? Uh, let me talk about corporate extension and followed by research. Uh, you, have a, you have a package, and I'm not... I'm not going to, we're going to read all the material that you have here. Uh, please take a time and take a look at the material that we have here uh, in the packet. Uh, on your left side, you have a corporate extension program bulletin. Uh, this bulletin outlines pretty much what we do with the different programs in corporate extension. We have an ag natural resource uh, program. We have a family consumer science program. Community Development Program, which we just reinstituted about a year ago, and we had the 4-H and Youth Development. Uh, as we stated at the beginning, there are two land grants in the state, so a lot of our programs, a lot of the work that we do, uh, we, we do it in collaboration with our colleagues at the University of Georgia, uh, both on main campus as well as in the field. Uh, we have about 15 cooperative extension agents that are in the field. And to give you an idea as to how the agents are, I would say, positioned or located, our cooperative extension agents are located in an office with the University of Georgia uh, cooperative extension uh, 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 agents as well as uh, the program. So this 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 the way that this the uh, field activity has basically has worked since uh, I know before my time. And we found this to be a very efficient and effective way of, of programming. Um, our target audience over the years primarily has been small and limited resource farmers, uh, as well as small farmers. And our program is, is from, from a training perspective, uh, targets primarily that audience. 
uh, our program is not limited to that audience. Uh, we have, well, actually we had uh, until December the, 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 the 31st, one of our specialists who was also our program leader for Ag and Natural Resources, Dr. Will Getz. Uh, Dr. Getz, in my opinion, has really, ha has really over the years blossomed our small ruminant program. We're talking primarily goats. Uh, Dr. Getz has uh, interacted and trained many people throughout the state and beyond that's interested in, in small ruminant, in this case primarily goats. I say uh, primarily goats because he has a love for sheep as well. Uh, unfortunately, he retired in December, but fortunately we was able to, uh, to, 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 to buy 30% to buy of his time, so he still would be with us and he still would be engaged in programming. The Focus Magazine, the Focus Bulletin, is a bulletin that we use uh, to really highlight some programs and successes in extension. Uh, the one that I'm holding up is the most recent one. Uh, I, I, I reviewed the next one that's coming out here shortly, yesterday. Uh, the person that's on the, co on the cover uh, is a person that decided to meet with us and we talked and we formed a, a collaborative effort with uh, Mr. Martin here. Uh, Mr. Martin is the uh, CEO of Gotcha Goats. Uh, he markets product, fresh goat product to, to Kroger's in and around this area. Uh, so that has been a very good relationship. Uh, there's a story in this booklet that, that's, that discusses those activities. So if you get a chance, take a, take a look at it as well. Um, the second focus is an older focus. I put it in uh, primarily to give you just a, a little snapshot of the safe center uh, and also the center for think it in this one gives you a shot of a organic garden system that we have on campus and we are we're excited about that. Uh, we we have a person in horticulture that's into gardening, into organic gardening, so we have an 18 acre organic system that we have that we have devoted to vegetables, uh, orchard, tree crops, nut crops. So we, we definitely invite you, if you're, if you're in the area, stop by, we'll be glad to give you a tour. How many dogs and cats can hold uh, dogs and cats up to a hundred each. And the dogs round up the cats. <laughs> <laughs> well, we keep we keep we keep them separated. <laughs> we keep we keep them separated. <laughs> uh, this this is a picture of uh, a one-hour farm, our research farm, and that's the site where we usually have a field day every every two years. So uh, when we have our next field day, you will receive an invitation. And we would love to, we would love to have you to visit the uh, the campus. Uh, this 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 publication is highlights some of our research activities. Uh, our research activities, as indicated earlier, uh, our research activities focus on small ruminants naturally because we do a lot with small ruminants, goats primarily. Uh, in addition to the small ruminant, we have a small ruminant research center, extension center. And we also are doing some work with biofuels, primarily grasses, and we're looking at some sweet solving work as well. Uh, we're looking in collaboration with a partner that we have in Oklahoma with the sweet sorghum, uh, primarily interested in working with that person because of the dry land nature uh, of, that, of that area. On the right side of your book, there are two maps, Georgia maps. Uh, the first map, I want to highlight what we're, what we're doing here uh, at those locations throughout the state. In addition to our cooperative extension agents that we have located in the field, and the agents cover primarily 34 counties, we have what we call a mobile technology classroom. It's an 18-wheel unit which has about 25 computer stations, and that unit has served us uh, extremely well. Um, 
we we provide training to farmers from the, from training USDA training when it comes to developing farm plans. Uh, we work, we use that unit in, in, in conjunction with farm service agents. We take it out to the field, set up wherever they want to set it up, and invite farmers to come in. Uh, farmers, uh, seniors, youth, uh, you name it. Uh, if there's an opportunity to utilize this facility, citizens want to utilize this, 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 the mobile technology classroom, and it is available, they can use it. Now, for this map, uh, for, for, the, for, uh, for the last few years, uh, we worked with seniors on Medicare, uh, Medicare, in the, on the Medicare initiative. And the counties that we have highlighted on this, on this map are counties where the unit provided training over 2012. With Georgia Care, we partnered with Georgia Care, uh, and the training was related to the State Health Insurance Assistance Program, they call SHIP and also the Senior Medicare Patrol Initiative. This was an outreach initiative where uh, Georgia Care wanted to enroll uh, many citizens, many rural citizens in the, in, in the program. And what that meant was that Georgia Care was, was targeting individuals in Medicare who assist a program and educated Medicare beneficiaries uh, to protect them as it relates to health and also to give them ideas as to what to look for in the case of health care fraud. Uh, there was 22 statewide events that, as, as it's located here, uh, which included uh, the Social Security Administration, the Division of Family and Children's Services, Walgreen, Hampton Inn, Senior Centers, senior centers, centers and others. Uh, some of the successes in, from this particular training utilizing this unit included uh, that was about 375 extra help, extra help provided to low income subsidies applica applications and that Georgia Care uh, estimated a saving of about 1.5 million dollars just, just by providing that training. Uh, <laughs> They target, they train 404 qualified Medicare beneficiaries and the potential saving there are a little over half a million dollars. Uh, so other uh, target training included 171 Medicare Part C enrollments, which was completed, and 553 Medicare Part D prescription drug plans enrollment were completed. So we were very excited about, about, about this opportunity and we see this opportunity uh, continuing. From our rural community development component, our rural development area, uh, we just received a grant uh, from USDA for $100,000 for $100, and about $39,000 added to that. The, the lighter color blocks include the counties in which we are serving. And basically what what, what, what the, uh, the SET program, the Strong Economies Together, uh, is a training sit uh, situation where any local individuals are being trained uh, to really just see what can be done in order to enhance the economy uh, in, 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 the, in those rural areas. So that project has just, just taken off and we are, as we indicated, we are, we are excited about that. Uh, one other uh, project, that success story that I would like to highlight is right next door to, to Peach County, that's Twix County, uh, University of Georgia, and, and, I, and one of our extension um, specialists was able to get a grant fund where they was targeting 4-H, 4-H youth. And as a result of getting that grant funded, um, youth from both, uh, uh, targeted by both UGA and Fort Valley, 4-Hers, these are 4-Hers, was able to spend about a week in Washington D.C. and and focus out and focus on citizenship Washington. It was a, focus, a citizenship Washington focus. Uh, as a result of that experience, uh, the first I think it was the first year, um, I think the, the, the library uh, was destroyed. The Twist County Library was destroyed, and these students led the efforts in raising money to rebuild the library. So we're very, we're very excited about that, 
those collaborative efforts. And I could go on and on, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, but uh, we have we have, we have we have some excellent programs. Uh, we have some excellent outreach programs. Uh, we also have some excellent research programs, and we uh, we have we, we have seen those programs grow. Uh, we are working more with farmers now. We are farmers are been in, uh, farmers are engaged. Uh, whereas in the past and past years, it was very difficult to get small farmers to really just come to meetings and and, and receive the, the, the training they need to sustain their their operation. And we we see, we see changes in that direction, and we're very very excited about that. Any questions? Thank you for Don Lamar. Thank you for coming, sir. You know, Fort Valley sometimes don't get the recognition that that Cal College in Athens does, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, we know y'all down there and we appreciate what y'all do, especially for smaller farmers. Uh, anybody have any questions? Oh, we got a bunch, brother. Well, I just have a comment. Okay. Follow up. The folks in the island that we can and I think the national boy came down and did a video for the farm there in national program. He dedicated to the group of kids. First of all, it's one way to have a real establish a library that's controlled by an act that's an act of nature. And we see a small school retirement on County 8, William Sutton. Is he still working in any capacity? Well, still. But, uh,
the numbers I can't give you because I don't know. But uh, as far as the number of people that are interested in raising goats and growing goats, those numbers have increased over the last two, three years. Uh, okay. Beyond what we were about to do for five years ago. And I gave, I also gave a lot on the, the, the number of 4 H that are, that are showing goats now compared to uh, three years ago. The exact number I cannot tell you because I don't know personally uh, what the other thing is. The last more I know about Tom. Goat showing is the fastest growing youth activity in FFA and 4-H. Uh, even from the little bitty kid on up. And I know we're sitting here with beef in front of us and chicken people too, but worldwide, goat meat is probably eaten more than, than even one of the, the two that we think is, is the, uh, the main things to eat worldwide. And it is a growing industry in Georgia, and y'all's research down there is priceless on, on, on the small remnant stuff. He, uh, he talked a little bit about got your goat. Y'all know what? It, when I grew up, everybody, if you get all ir irritated and agitated for somebody to ask you who got your goat, y'all know where that came from? <laughs> it seems to be that in the racehorse industry, they would put a goat in the stall with the racehorse before the night, the night before the big race to calm the horse down. And opposing trainers would go in and steal a goat out of the horse pen, and the, and the racehorse would get all agitated, and that's how come everybody wants to know who got your goat when, uh, when, you, when you seem to be agitated. So if somebody asks you who got your goat, that's where it came from. Uh, <laughs> What you gonna learn in ag committee? <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> we have, thank you, sir. We have one more presentation. I kind of waited. Send the gentleman up. I kind of waited till y'all put y'all kind of toward the end because there were some people wanting to get here, and I didn't know if they were hung up in traffic. If y'all have never seen this essential economy presentation, you don't want to see it again. And uh, it's, it's probably one of the best presentations I've ever seen. Um, it talks about a lot of the stuff that uh, we really don't think about. And uh, Senator Moody, Senator John Ripper, John, John Bullock called me this morning and uh, said for me to tell y'all howdy. He's, uh, he's sitting in his shop in Oak Rockney and uh, not missing this place at all. He said he misses all of us, but he doesn't miss this place. So. Well, I hope he's online, Mr. Chairman, watching us. Uh, we'll reach out and say we're looking better. He, he, he is doing better. He is. Uh, but without me messing up an introduction to y'all, I'm going to let you handle it from here on. Yeah, we have a red dot now. I'm Dan Moody, and uh, my good friend Sam Zamaripa and I really appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman, that you've devoted to us today. And we would also like to thank the committee members for the sacrifices you make to serve in the General Assembly and address the needs of the state. We've broken our uh, discussion this morning into two parts. I'm going to give you some background uh, about an organization that we call the Essential Economy. And then uh, Sam's going to go into uh, more detail about some uh, results of a study we recently completed. And some of you may recall a, a brochure that was put on your desk. Uh, the chairman sponsored its distribution in the House chamber a few weeks ago. Uh, if you haven't got a chance to look at it, uh, we're going to uh, review some of those details today. But please keep it in your reading stack for later this summer because it gives you a good foundation and a good review of, of what the essential economy is all about. 
some of you uh, may not realize that Sam and I served together in the state senate. We were first elected in 2002. Sam's district in Atlanta uh, meant that uh, he represented a, a large group of Democrats. I uh, served in North, uh, or from North Fulton, and consequently, uh, I represented a large group of Republicans in my district. So uh, we found that uh, once we got into the Senate, we agreed on uh, lots of things. We both have a, a strong business background. Uh, we didn't always vote alike, uh, but oftentimes we did. And uh, you'll be surprised that uh, uh, Sam actually was uh, the final vote that we needed to create the city of Sandy Springs. And uh, if you like what's going on in Sandy Springs, you can thank Sam. If you don't, you can blame me because I <laughs> talked him into voting for that uh, incorporation. Uh, likewise, I actually voted for a tax increase once as a Republican, so you can see that uh, <laughs> I voted against it. <laughs> so you, you can see that um, uh, we we frustrated our leadership on, on many occasions. But uh, after we left the Senate, we stayed in touch. We visited on the phone uh, several times uh, over the course of uh, the, the time that we uh, left the Senate and. One time we were talking about some of the issues that the state was facing, uh, education uh, issues, transportation, and this was about uh, almost two years ago uh, at a time that there was a lot of discussion about getting jobs into the state of Georgia, good jobs. And I applaud the, the efforts uh, on the part of the governor, um, the uh, work that Chris Kaminsky is doing, to attract those good, knowledge-based, high-paying jobs to the state. But as Sam and I talked about this, we realized that there was a, a large foundation below that tier of, of uh, jobs in the state that really had to be there to support the attraction of those jobs to the state. And if you think about it, when you bring some of these companies uh, to Georgia to look at the opportunities we can give them. Those people want to have clean sheets in their hotel rooms. They want to eat off of clean plates. And that foundation really needs to be in place to attract those types of jobs that we all would like to see in the state. As we looked at these um, uh, sectors of our economy that really support the top tier, we realized that they, they had at least two things in common. And these sectors, uh, as we looked uh, uh, across those uh, uh, industry groups, and these include, as I mentioned, the, the hotel industry, uh, the restaurant industry, the poultry industry, uh, vegetable growers, um, the Home Builders Association, the landscaping industry. As you look at those sectors across our economy, these two things that they all have in common is the people that work in these industries primarily work with their hands, and they don't have to have a lot of uh, credentials to get jobs in those sectors. There's a lot of on-the-job training for these people. If, if you take a step back and um, start to look at that uh, like we did, we were curious, really, what is the contribution of those sectors to the quality of our life in this state? Uh, we reached out to people that um, were experts in the economy, and frankly, we didn't find any uh, work that had put together a comprehensive uh, study on the combination of these groups. There's a lot of information about the individual groups, but there wasn't any comprehensive uh, information. And we decided that in order to really address the needs of the state in terms of addressing uh, a lot of our quality of life issues, that it would be helpful to policymakers and lawmakers like yourself to have a good understanding about the contribution of those industry sectors. So 
uh, about a year and a half ago, we formed a 501c3 organization. Uh, Sam's very creative. He came up with the name the Essential Economy Council. Um, and we started to talk to other people in these industry groups. We created a board. And I'm going to read the, the, the names of the board members because I think this will give you a, a good understanding about uh, the momentum we've been able to put into the Essential Economy Organization. You know most of these people. Some of them are here today. Uh, people like Brian Toller, Charles Hall, David Ellis, Zippy Duvall, Mary Kay Woodworth, Mike Giles, Chris Butts, Steve Simon, Jay Morgan, Valerie Ferguson, and Karen Bremer. These are our board members today that have helped us get to where we are with the essential economy. And when we put the organization together, we started raising funds. As I mentioned, we are a 501c3 organization. We started applying for grant money. Uh, we were very successful with that, with a, a nice grant from the Kresge uh, Corp, uh, Foundation to help us fund some of our research. We reached out to the Boston Consulting Group initially to, to help us uh, start to test some of our uh, thoughts about the contribution of this organization, or the contribution of these sectors uh, to the quality of life in Georgia. And with that foundation, we hired uh, some uh, folks from uh, Georgia Tech within their um, um, sector, or within their community, that specializes in the economy. We also talked to one of our economic advisors, Sam Cunningham, with the Federal Reserve Bank uh, in Atlanta. And as you can imagine, they have a host of information uh, about uh, economy statistics. And Georgia Tech uh, basically started at our direction, and it was a paid study, by the way, to pull together the contribution of these sectors to the overall economy in Georgia. And that study was completed in the fall. Uh, part of that is in uh, the information we passed out in the House several weeks ago. Sam also has a much more detailed report uh, to share with you today. So. Uh, the only other thing I want to uh, share with you uh, before I turn it over to Sam to review some of the findings of the study, and Sam also does a great job of filling in the holes that I forgot to mention uh, in my presentation, um, is I want to make it very clear. We are a research organization. We don't have a push card with a policy agenda on it. We're not here today to ask you to uh, support a particular piece of legislation or to not support a piece of, a legis a piece of legislation. Our board members, on the other hand, as they represent their various associations, will do that. And they don't always agree, as you can imagine, because certain times a piece of legislation may uh, uh, help one of them and may hinder another. But ultimately, we've come together to address this large sector of our economy uh, called the essential economy. So, Mr. Chairman, if there aren't any questions for me, I'll go ahead and turn the rest of the program over to my good friend, Sam Samaripa. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. I will say this, that uh, in spite of all the, um, what you, what people are led to believe, the stories have been and always will be better in the House than they are in the Senate. Mr. Chairman. Um, so there is life after politics, uh, and, and one day <clears throat> I hope that each of you has the opportunity to work uh, with people that you make friends with while you serve uh, the state. Uh, Dan and I have been friends now for 12 years, and we've done a couple of things together, and I think this is just, it's been a lot of fun, and it's been a lot of, um, I think, good use of what you learn when you sit in the seats that you sit in. And Sam, I want to say to you that I think the House has gotten stronger since you've gotten there because the absence of Sam's does make a critical difference. This is, my, <laughs> this is an observation that I have concluded. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, a lot of what we have is on our internet, is on our website, and um, I'm not going to show that today because, um, frankly, there's, there's too much to show you. And if, if we whet your appetite with a little bit of information, uh, please to give, give us a call, and I'll come by and show you a lot more data. Uh, what we really want to do is give you a tool and a way to think about a big part of Georgia's economy. That, that's really the outcome of our work. That's the outcome of most good research. We're not here to uh, make you experts in it. Uh, we hope that uh, other people will be. For instance, we would love to work with Dr. Latimer at Fort Valley uh, on that, on being an expert, or John McKissick at UGA, or our friends at Georgia Tech uh, who did the study for us. But basically, the essential economy is, as Senator Moody said, it is six sectors. It is hotels, it is landscaping, it is hospitality, it's poultry, it's agribusiness, uh, and it's, uh, what am I missing, it's, it's personal care, and it's like construction. And all those sectors together, if you look at them in Georgia, together, they basically share a common workforce. And that workforce in general, Margaret, is undereducated. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a workforce that most of us have some, some association with, usually in our family. Because if you came from a family farm, or if your father or mother worked in manual labor or physical labor, you understand exactly the types of jobs we're talking about. And there was a time when those were the most of the jobs in Georgia. But as technology, the information economy has improved, what's happened is that people have migrated up to what we consider to be the better jobs, the knowledge economy jobs, the service sector jobs, the skilled jobs. In fact, most of, of what we do in the General Assembly is really promote that. We really promote a prepared workforce for the future. But the fact is that everything in the past is still very important. You still have to have a goat in every pot, or a chicken in every pot. So Dan and I went to look at uh, this workforce, and this had not been done in the way we did it. So we hired some very smart people from tech and uh, some very smart consultants from Georgia State, from University of Georgia, and the Federal Reserve Bank, and other places. And we said, "Tell us how many of these workers are in Georgia? How many? Tell us where they are. Tell us what sectors they're in." Tell us what they get paid, and we want to know over 10 years. We want to know going back to 2003. And so what you have in front of you is a summary of those findings. These came out in, in November. Mr. Chairman, it's taken us a while to package them. Um, but let me say what it says. And this was, frankly, surprising to us because we didn't, we didn't know. We thought it was big, but we didn't know how big. But it turns out, in very simple terms, there are about four million people working in Georgia. If you take eight or nine million people living in the state, and you carve out old people, you carve out retired people like Senator Moody, you carve out children, disabled people, you, it comes down to about four million people that our Department of Labor can account for that are really working. Of that four million, 25% of them fit the description of the essential economy. In other words, one out of every four workers is doing work that's this physical kind of work. They're either in a hotel, they're in a restaurant, they're in a retail uh, establishment that doesn't require any kind of higher education to operate a cash register. They're doing physical labor in the farm world. They're doing physical work in the, the forestry world. It, they're they're going to do physical work in the equine commission that you just started. So one out of every four workers in Georgia is in that cluster of the economy. We found that kind of shocking because most of us talk today about the, the knowledge economy. We talk about for our children, that's what we aspire to. For our, the hope of our state, that's what we aspire to. We're proud that our universities provide talented people to execute those jobs. We put a lot of money into that. But the fact is that our economy in Georgia, this is a conclusion from our study, cannot function without the essential economy. It is structural. So Sam, for instance, if you are lucky to get a Hyundai plant 
Barkia construction plant in your district and was in a greenfield, you couldn't build that unless it was surrounded by the essential economy. Why? Because people have to have places to sleep. People have to have food to eat. It has to be fresh. It has to be clean. It has to be safe. 24 hours a day, every day of the year. So the essential economy is an enabler. It's a structural component of what the state does. So for us to be able to come to the Ag Committee, and we know you understand this. We know you understand it from an agricultural point of view. But this is a great opportunity for us to say, this is something even a little larger than ag. But it's something you share with other colleagues who are interested in economic development, or education, or good public policy that supports the future of the state. So top findings are these, Mr. Chairman, and then I'm going to, uh, I'll explain any of the graphs that you're looking at in this, in this document. One, it's one out of every four jobs. Second, it's, it turns out that the essential economy is big in every one of our economic development regions. It's very big. In some, it's off the charts big. Three, it's big in all counties, all 159. And if you open to the middle of this book, you can see those blue, those blue lines. If you find your county, most of the counties hover north of 25% of the employee workforce. Fourth, if you just took the sales tax alone that these employees pay, just the sales tax, it's about $114 million every year. And then if you take the aggregate value of all these sectors together, of Brian Toller's group, of Charles Hall's group, of Karen Burma's group, of Chris Budd's group, it's $49 billion every year. So what we wanted to do was to give you a tool so that as, as, as policymakers, you are in a position to say, you know, we think that we need to understand the implications of anything we do related to these sectors combined. And that's what the essential economy is. The essential economy is to the working, undereducated folks what the knowledge economy is to the high-end corporate educated folks. So, Mr. Chairman, that's a summary of what we've done. We have a lot of data, and it's visual. And I can't show it, I think it would be hard to show it this morning, but I had it, I had it prepared because I was going to show, uh, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, I was going to show your district and how it broke out. But we have every single job by every single county, and it, it's defined by the, the definitions that you'll find in the back of this, which goes through the detail of the people we include. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll open for questions. Senator, um, tell me if I'm wrong. You can you do have it broken down where you can take Margaret Kaiser's district or counties and compare them to another county. That's correct. You, you can take her district and compare it to yeah. my district. In fact, if you go online, go to our website, and go to the map, you'll, you'll see every single county and every the proportion of every single county in the essential economy. You just click the county and it'll show you the data. It, and if you're, if you're interested in the more detail, we have this, I mean, this is a lot of information, but we have it so you can actually look at the county by every sector. So you can look at hospitality, you can look at restaurants, you can look at agribusiness, and you can see the number of jobs, and you can see down to the level of how many maids are in a county. So it's a lot to look at. But the real point, the real point is, is that when you put it all together, it's, it's big. The simplest graph that I can grasp is the pyramid on page 8 that, that explains what the essential economy, where it is in the uh, workforce and what it is, and it gives you an idea how big it is. Yes, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's the, the most important thing to take away from this is that there are parts of the economy that you're accustomed to talking about. Most of us talk about the knowledge economy or the services economy. That's kind of where we focus. We, and we put this together so you could see that there's this other cluster down there called the essential economy. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I just wanted to point out, too, uh, it, it's in the report, but uh, I don't think we mentioned it. Our data was not based on any surveys that we did. The data comes from the Department of Labor, Georgia Tech, uh, with some of their confidentiality agreements has access to that data. So this was based on uh, information that employers provide uh, to the state 
It wasn't done through any surveys that we conducted. So we feel like the information is very independent. Back to your other question, Mr. Chairman. So, so uh, Alice, if you took Lowndes and Clinch, if you take the southern Georgia um, uh, region, it's 28% of the workforce in that region, in that region where a couple of your counties reside. And then, Mr. Chairman, uh, you, you cut across a couple of regions. And, but in the Northeast Georgia region, it's 27%. So your home county, it would be roughly that percentage. And then uh, buddy down towards your way, uh, in middle Georgia, it's 25.6%. And in the heart of Georgia, it's 25.5% of that workforce. So and everything yeah, comes out to a fourth of the workforce. It's a fourth of the workforce. It's, and and it's, it's been that way for 10 years. And it's going to be that way in 10 years. We're working on a forecast now. So I think as you go forward as policymakers, it's good to, when, when our board members come to you, remember that they're representing something much larger. Because actually there's a lot of mobility across these sectors. They share a workforce. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. One comment and a question. Um, I want to say what great company I feel um, I'm in here. I get told sometimes by friends that you're like Sam Zanarippa in the house, and that's a huge compliment. But I love the bipartisanship and that an urban senators here. But the one thing, and I was thrilled to say that you wanted to sort of collaborate with Dr. Lattimore, because I think the one thing that I hear over and over is workforce, but what I'm not hearing, and this may not even be something that your uh, commission has done, is again, not to belabor the point, but the workforce, the struggles that I have in the restaurant industry, and I got to fly down with Brian Toler. I've been to Arlen Moultrie now to meet with farmers, and they say the same thing, that the immigration debate was so harmful to their industry because they cannot get a workforce that is steady, that will work the hours they need. We're having the same struggles in the restaurant business. Um, just the workforce is, seems out there if you give the unemployment rate, looking at the 9%. But getting them trained to do the job has been our biggest struggle. Folks showing up and they can't get to work on time, but they're not dressed appropriately. Um, I mean, and we are overly generous uh, business owners. I've gone and picked up employees who can't get to work on time because we needed them there. And that's been our biggest challenge in now expanding our um, restaurant growth because the employees just don't have the skills to come in and do the job. Even though they're, you know, what you're saying, they're undereducated or... There are four threats to the essential economy. Four. The top one, unfortunately, we all share something in common with. Everybody's getting older. And the older the workforce, the less capable they are of executing the work at this level. And I know that you've probably been following the age demography in Georgia, but it's a serious issue. Sometime in the next 15 years, the vast majority of people tip over the age of 60. So, so age is the number one threat to the essential economy. The second threat is that we all we're doing every day, and it's important, and we should, is we're encouraging all of our young people to become educated and go into the knowledge economy. I have not asked my daughter to get ready for Gotcha Goat, even though I'd like to own it. Yeah, she went to a fine university as do your children or your grandchildren or your young children, you have, that's what you aspire. So we call that the aspirational challenge. The third threat to the essential economy is regulatory. And I know that you all pay a lot of attention to that, but because the margins are, are fixed, because the, the price of a tomato or the price of a watermelon has been in play for hundreds of years, and those margins have been squeezed and squeezed, the cost of making a bed has been squeezed and squeezed, so those margins are very tiny in comparison to the knowledge economy. We have these big, big overvaluated propositions. The fourth threat to the, to, to the essential economy is immigration, because we have, as a country, used immigrants to fulfill roles as we transition, and we've done that for hundreds of years. So those four things, Margaret, are the, are the threats. And if you add them all up, it does, it does make uh, my child lose a little sleep at night, it does make Brian Tolar lose a little sleep at night. It does make Karen Bremer wonder how we're going to expand it. And I want to say one last thing about that point. And a healthy, essential economy does a lot of things. But most important, it gives people mobility. So if you're a Dem, 
and you're thinking about this, think about the mobility that the essential economy provides. It is still a place where a person with no education can show up and work. And the first day they're a laborer, the next day they're, they're a crew manager, the next day they're a manager, the next day they're thinking about getting a truck. They get that truck, they get a trailer, they're competing with Tommy Williams now. <laughs> so and you can do that, but you cannot do that at IBM. You can't do that at the house. You've got to pay your dues. But you can do that in the essential economy. It is still full of, of America possibility. And so for a lot of Georgians, 25% of the workforce, it is a place of opportunity. So it creates great things. And if you're on the right side of this and you're thinking it through, please understand that the economics that come out of this aggregate cluster are very big. They're very big. And the alternative, the alternative to not having a healthy essential economy is not pretty. Because it basically is employing people that, to some extent, have some risks. And so it is a very important part of the economy. It's structural. And that's really the message we have for you. And, and uh, Mr. Chairman, also I'll restate that if someone would like to see their data, we can do that very easily online with them. Anybody else? Like one, one yes, sir. Time. And that is, it is not agriculture. But we just attract the industry, which is a huge problem. Yeah. And, and it, it needs someone who can operate a certain institution. Correct. It's going to be from this essential time. Yes. Well, they're trying to train them. Yes. Hey, yeah. Well, they're trying to train them. Hey, yeah. Well, they're trying to train them. Hey, yeah. Well, they're trying to train them. And I think that mm -hmm. may be the key mm -hmm. to, to agriculture work. Those skills at the end of that time they spent with us and that industry paying the way to college. That's right. I'm not trying to find y'all something else to do, but there's some folks that sit on this committee that have some influence over some development authorities in our various parts of the state that need to see what y'all have. We would very, be, be very interested in presenting to some development authorities because we can do the data regionally. And I think the, the economic development folks can really dig into this stuff. You guys are policymakers. It's a little different uh, assignment. Uh, but, but we would like to do that. Uh, uh, we're also uh, preparing now for our national study that we hope to do uh, later this year. Um, and But Georgia has been the place we test the concept. Yes, sir. If I might add something here that I think maybe we need to try to figure out somehow more for it. Presentation is that this is not an issue of cheap labor. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the people that think that uh, we've got uh, domestic folks in this uh, uh, loose job because of uh, illegal immigration and all that sort of stuff, uh, they, they haven't got the picture that uh, it is not the matter of, uh, uh, of cheap jobs. Uh, that, these people, first off, uh, 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 they're not willing to do, to have been called the work ethics. We, 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 we need to focus on our education on uh, academics, the three R's, and we can fail to educate our people on uh, the sense of having uh, a work ethic for sure that whole time. Yes, uh, uh, Mark, he is the best appropriate of the public. And, and uh, let's see, uh, uh, people that, uh, that uh, a lot of this involved here is just uh, a matter of just plain work ethics. And, and, and so many of these folks, uh, you know, they're be assigned to what these folks really make to some of these jobs. And, and, uh, 
we can fail to educate a lot of our kids in our education system, uh, the importance of this plain, simple work ethic. Ellis, it's a, it's a very important issue, and I think you talked to Mike Childs about it or mine. I think they'd say the same thing. And uh, when Dan and I talked about this, uh, we made some little recommendations in the back that you can take a look at. But basically, it, 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 uh, I think if, we, if our board takes a leadership role here, I think we can make some good recommendations around work ethic. Uh, around a, a path to learning uh, more, having more skills. Uh, so I think that there are things that can be done. We're very comfortable, everyone's very comfortable doing that at the university level, uh, and to some extent at the community college level. And, and, and maybe what this, this work says is that there's, an, there's another step in here somewhere. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, have you worked, met with any of the career academies around the state? I mean, this is your mission and what they're doing in a lot of these career academies is so similar that to show them that data that one out of every four jobs is going to be in this essential economy would, would just fit right in with what they're doing and with the high school kids today. I'm not representative, but we'd welcome that chance. Thank you. So, I was just going to follow up. If you drill down into the, the website information, you'll see the salary information that you uh, indicated uh, by county, and you can get into the detail that you'd like. And, and to your point, uh, there are some well-paying jobs in this sector. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To the committee member, this has been an unusually long ag meeting, and it has worked out where it did because we got some language cleared up on 209 that we had to hold a while ago, so pull 209 back out of your folders. Things work fast around here sometimes. And we, we don't have, but I think, what, six more days left, so time's running short, and to some of you newer people, you'll find out. But, Speaker Murphy used to say from now to the 40th day is the most dangerous time in this whole session because stuff starts getting fixed and stuff starts getting questioned and you get down to the last two or three days, you really got to start paying attention. But Chairman Wilkinson had to go to another meeting and I'm going to try my best. I think I understand this from talking to him the other day. All this says is basically that, you know, you can print off a will or, or a um, do not resuscitate or, or anything offline. You can print it and it will be a binding document. But somewhere in that, pre in where you print it off, the company that you either buy it from or get it for free or whatever off the of internet, they will have to say line 20 and 21 where it says that, uh, you know, they're not a substitute for Regina Quick's advice. So, uh, is that, that's pretty much what this bill does. Uh, it just says that, that, you know, you can print it off and it'll be okay, but you really need to go talk to somebody who's an expert in that field. Most time they talk about a lawyer. So, uh, has anybody got any questions? If, if they do, I'll try to answer them. If they don't, uh, I mean, if, you, if I can't, we'll get you an answer. Uh, maybe somebody in the audience that can answer it. Yes? Yeah. I'm going to make a motion to pass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Got a motion in a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, no. Next week, we are in the process, we being mainly Buddy Harden, of rewriting the Flint River Drop Protection Act that, that was put in in 1999 and it's having to be updated. We're going to do that next week. They put it in ag because it is an ag issue. Uh, if you got any suggestions, uh, we got to fix the mess that the Senate made of it. So, um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, we'll have a hearing on that, a full hearing before we vote, or can I'll make that in the request. Well, we can. Just pay attention, and when we get, when we get the language close and all, we'll, we'll, we'll have a hearing on it. Is that okay with you, buddy? Give you some practice. Um, but we'll just pay attention. Remember the filet biscuits in the morning and the chicken at dinner time? And I hadn't said anything to Farm Bureau or Brian Toller or Charles Hall or any of them, but I did talk to, um, my mind just went blank. Who's the expo guy? 
Chip Blaylock, about putting together a tour for, since we got so many new committee members and some of them are from uh, other than rural areas, maybe in the fall, uh, go by and look at a half a million dollar cotton picking in the field and then go buy a gin and then wind up and get Chip to take us to some things that he thinks we need to see at the expo in October. And then we'll just turn you loose at the expo. Uh, there's an education type thing. We did it in northeast Georgia two or three years ago, and I think it got a real good reception. So uh, we are uh, going to try to look at doing something like that in the fall. Thank you all again for setting through uh, a long meeting. Thank you again for what you did for my daddy, and we adjourn. I'm glad you did that. That's uh, all that period. I mean, so they did it. Yeah, just